and uh, welcome to our annual uh, Mahindra Lecture, Harish Singh Mahindra Lecture, uh, sponsored by the South Asia Institute. It's a pleasure to have you here. And it's a privilege to welcome uh, Nandan Nilkani. Thank you, sir, for agreeing to, for agreeing to come. Uh, Nandan doesn't need an introduction, but I'll just say a few brief words. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure where to begin. I was handed this long list of accomplishments, but I'm not sure it's really necessary, so I'll just speak from, uh, speak from myself, really. Um, Nandan is best known as one of the uh, co-founding team of Infosys, the uh, company that uh, uh, really shook up, one of, one of several that really shook up India and demonstrated to the prowess of the Indian private sector in a variety of ways. So its significance extends much beyond the, the software sector. I think it just demonstrated if you will, a new role for the private sector in a developing country, and in that sense has been a role model and a beacon for many. Um, I know personally I and my colleague HBS have learned a lot from uh, NRM and Nanda and Shibu and Chris and a whole bunch of uh, uh, band of merry, merry, uh, merry warriors who built, built this enterprise. Um, more recently, Nanda has taken on multiple public roles uh, he's here ostensibly to speak about the digital ecosystem. Many of us know him as uh, the creator, co-creator with another band of uh, merry, different band of merry men and women to create Aadhaar, the biometric ID that uh, I wrote a case study on with some colleagues at HBS and so we use quite extensively. So it's always fun in class to talk about it and to get people in different audiences around the world to appreciate the significance of it. Uh, and uh, there are, there's, as I said, there's a long list of uh, public and private uh, roles that Nandan has continued to play uh, across India and across the world. I don't remember when I first met him. I think it was probably at the World Economic Forum or someplace, or maybe in Bangalore, a very long time ago. And uh, it's been a privilege to have been in touch, and equivalently to have met Rohini through him, and uh, also realized what an amazing force of philanthropy you've been also and your family's been and through you to your children and your, I was gonna say your son in children, but I meant son-in-law, uh, who was also in my class, is here as well. Um, so it's nice to have the whole family with us. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I thought what we'd do is, uh, now that you can make your comments, and uh, I would prefer to sit there rather than behind the flowers so that I can hear you face up, and then I'll try to moderate a discussion if I'm needed, and otherwise the floor is all yours. Uh, but welcome, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming. Uh, thanks, Tarun, and it's it's really great to be here giving this, how to make this work. Okay, um, the Harish Mahindra lecture, because I, I do have a long uh, family association. My brother began his career with the Mahindras 40 years back. My uncle was a, one of the company doctors, so I guess I do have a Mahindra connection. So I'm delighted that you asked me to speak on this occasion, and I spoke to Anand also about what a great opportunity this is. Uh, I thought I'll speak briefly on uh, on the Aadhaar project and then move to what it means in terms of designing uh, a digital ecosystem. Uh, Aadhaar is a project which was uh, begun by the Indian government about uh, seven, eight years back. And uh, I joined the government about five years back to implement the project. And the project was to give uh, a unique identity number to every resident of uh, India, which meant giving a unique identity number to a billion or people. And the important thing was that it should be unique in the way that everybody should be uniquely identified. Now, there were a couple of reasons uh, for taking on this uh, ambitious venture. The first was that there are still a large number of people in India who don't have an acknowledged uh, proof of their existence because uh, uh, in many states, the birth registry system doesn't work as well as it should, and more than half the kids born don't have a, a birth certificate because they're not born in a hospital, or they're born in some remote village, or they have to pay a bribe to get a birth certificate. As somebody said recently, that India corruption starts from womb to tomb, so getting the birth certificate is part of that. So whatever be the reason, a large number of people don't have uh, birth certificates. And increasingly, that becomes a bottleneck to their lives because they can't get a lot of things done because they don't have a proof of existence. So this is, in some sense, you can think of it as the world's largest social inclusion project because it's about giving people who are unrecorded in the system some kind of recorded identity. And you can think of this as a 21st century form of Ellis Island. 
because if you remember what happened at Ellis Island in the uh, you know, 19th century, you had a lot of immigrants coming from Ireland, Italy, Eastern Europe, and whatever their name be in their home country, they were given, often given a new name here, and that became their name for the rest of their lives. So think of it as people coming from the unidentified world into the identified world. So that's one reason, social inclusion. The second reason, which was from the government point of view, was that uh, over the last 15 years, the Indian government has substantially increased its uh, expenditure on building a welfare system, uh, entitlement subsidies, guaranteed employment, healthcare, education, uh, pensions, scholarships, and so on, and, and subsidies like petroleum subsidies, food subsidies, and so forth. And all these entitlement subsidies started really growing, and today are in excess of about $60 billion a year. And all these entitlement subsidies go to individuals. And when the underlying system of identifying individuals is dysfunctional, then there's a very high likelihood that the money doesn't really go to the people it's meant to reach. And there are estimates ranging from 10 to 40 percent of the, these entitlement subsidies not reaching the intended person, which is uh, obviously a waste of public expenditure. So the second reason for this project, equally important reason for the project, was to really make government expenditure more efficient and more effective and make sure that benefits that are targeted to an individual to actually reach that individual. So it really this came from two points of view. The point of view of creating social inclusion for a large number of people without identity, and from the point of view of creating a much more efficient way of delivering benefits to people who have to get the benefits. Now, identity has happened in societies for different reasons. Uh, in the 15th and 16th century in Europe, uh, people started getting identity because governments wanted to identify soldiers for the draft bring into the armies, or churches want to identify people who would pay church taxes, and therefore you have the whole concept of identity and surnames and all that began in that era. And in the 20th century, uh, you had identity numbers uh, in the US in the 1930s with the social security number, which was set up because they had to build a welfare system where you, you knew the person for 20, 30 years till he was entitled to get his social security, and that concept has been there in other countries like all the, all the European countries. So in India, it really came only now in the 21st century, essentially because the welfare state was driving a large number of people and you have to get that whole thing right. So when we came to this, our challenge was how do we give a billion people uh, an ID and how do we make sure it's unique? Now, this is a challenge because if millions and millions of the people out there don't have any proof of existence at all, and many of them share the same name. How do you really identify someone uniquely? And even if you, and even if you allow people to enroll and you can't identify them uniquely, what, what is to prevent then people from enrolling into the system many times and getting multiple IDs, which would defeat the whole purpose of this project? And therefore, we said we, we, the only way we could really fix this problem was to use a biometric way of digital uh, identification, and uh, the system we have built uses what's called as multimodal biometrics. It, it essentially looks at the 10 fingerprints and the iris of both the eyes. And we believe that for each individual has sufficient digital diversity to make it unique across a billion people. Now, historically, biometrics had not been used for a developmental purpose. Historically, biometrics like fingerprints have been used for forensics, and subsequently for you know, terrorism, identifying of terrorists, and you know, when people come into the US, they have to give the biometrics at JFK Airport or Logan or whatever. And so this was the first time we turned it around and said, let's use the same technology, but use it for the purpose of giving people a unique ID, which can then be used for improving their lives. And therefore, we turned it around. And Till we built this, the largest such system was about 100 million odd people. So we had the goal of using this for a billion people. So this hadn't really been done before, and many people said it, it could not be done. But from our analysis, we built, we thought we could build a platform where the biometric diversity was sufficiently accurate for us to give 
uh, accuracy of 99.99% in terms of uh, uniqueness across a billion people. Now, to build this, we also had the advantage of the internet revolution because in the last few years, the internet companies have shown that you actually can build very large databases. Today you have, Facebook has more than a billion uh, people on Facebook and WhatsApp has 600 million and uh, YouTube has a billion page views per day and so forth. And therefore the internet had shown that you could actually think of creating a database of, of a billion people because it's already proved by the internet companies. The second thing that the internet companies had done was build scalable technology for building such applications, basically in open source. So if you look at what's inside a lot of these companies, they use technology like Linux or Apache or MySQL or Hadoop or whatever, and they were all designed to handle very, very large volumes of data. So we use the technology of the internet companies but built it for this ID system. So the entire platform we have built is essentially in open source and using very cheap off-the-shelf components and built on standard you know, uh, PC architecture so you can really create a highly scalable architecture. We also had to make sure that we built a system that could scale and uh, we set a goal that we would do uh, we would build a system that would do one to one and a half million Aadhaar issuances per day because that's the only way we could get to the scale that we had in mind. And uh, so scalability was very important and we have therefore built a very large system of maybe a few thousand computers all interconnected to do this kind of uh, computation. Because deduplication, which is what you do, is a very intensive activity. And the, the concept is very simple that when somebody enrolls into the system, uh, we essentially compare that person's biometrics with all the biometrics of the people that are already there. And so it's like a comparison of, of all the data you have. Now, if you have about 500 million people in the database and, 100, and, a, and a million new people arrive that day, that is equal to 500 trillion matches that have to happen to find out who's a duplicate and who's not a duplicate. So it has to be a very compute intensive kind of a job. So when we build a system which does about 500 to 700 trillion matches every night to eliminate duplicates from the database. Now that was as far as the, the back end goal, the ability to give a million plus uh, uh, you know, IDs a day. But the equally important challenge is how do we build the front end so that a million people come to us to enroll every day. And for that, we built uh, what we called as an enrollment and registration ecosystem where we tapped into state governments, banks, uh, oil companies, insurance companies, and so on, all of whom became our partners for enrollment. And we built, again, a scalable way for them to quickly roll out enrollment stations. So today, the system would have about 25,000 enrollment stations across the country where people can walk in and enroll. And that's how the system is capable of doing a million uh, plus a day. Currently, it's probably doing about 700,000, but hopefully it'll scale up again to above a million. So the back end was solved by using technology. The front end was solved by creating an ecosystem of partners who rolled out these enrollment stations. And we gave every one of these enrollment stations a standard client application, you know, like giving everybody windows. We gave an application that did all the work for them, and they could enroll people within a few minutes. So when we set out the system, we uh, set out a goal of uh, doing uh, 600 million enrollments in five years. So we achieved that in about four and a half years. We got 600 million people issued, and today the the current number of people who have Aadhaar is about 700 million. Uh, so we're looking at crossing a billion by, I mean, we meaning the government is looking at crossing a billion by next year and hopefully universal coverage in the next couple of years. Now, that's as far as the ID goes, but what were the uses of this ID? I think the biggest and the first use which drove it was establishing uniqueness. Because establishing uniqueness meant that a person had only one ID. And this was very important because in the government expenditure programs, uh, there was, as I explained, a fair amount of leakage because of duplicates in the database or ghosts in the database. And uh, this system essentially 
For example, if you have 100 people who have to get a pension, if you then ask all the 100 people to give their Aadhaar IDs, it, the ID is called Aadhaar, which means foundation, uh, then the 100 shrinks to 70 because 30 of them don't exist or they're duplicates. And therefore, just the reduction in wastage, the compression in wastage by using the uniqueness feature of the number for removing ghosts and duplicates in the, in, the, in the databases of various entitlement programs is capable of saving the government billions of dollars. So we estimate that the Indian government spends about $60 billion a year on various entitlements and subsidies. And there's the potential to reduce that by about $10 billion a year based on what we know of the, the, the leakage happening in various programs. So that alone makes it a very attractive uh, project to make government expenditure more efficient. So the first big usage of this was the fact that it was a unique number which could eliminate ghosts and duplicates. The second thing is that it's also the first attempt to create a digital identity. Now, digital identities are very important because as we are seeing now in the world, being able to confirm in a robust, unequivocal manner in a digital world that you are the person you claim to be is very, very important. Because as more and more services go online, as, as you do your transactions online, you buy online, you pay online, you get all your documents online, uh, the ability to make sure that you are the person you claim to be becomes extremely important. And we know that if that doesn't work well, then we have a lot of uh, fraud and you know, people lose the credit card numbers or people lose the photographs on, on the cloud or whatever. So having a very robust way of authenticating that the person is the genuine person is very important. So since we're anyway going to build a digital ID system, we said let's provide a way of authenticating that the person is the person they claim to be. So along with giving them the ID, which is a 12-digit number, we also built an online authentication system or an online verification system where we actually use the same biometric which we used for giving the number to give uh, to be able to verify it online. So suppose I uh, go somewhere and I have to get, get some money out of my account, I just say my number is 123, and they have a device on which I put my finger or they check my eye, and they confirm that I am the same person that I claim to be, and then they can release the money. Now, so, and that was, when we designed it, that was 2009. And now, as you know, the iTouch, the Touch ID on the Apple phone does the same thing. It basically does a biometric verification of your fingerprint. Uh, so we provide that at scale in an online environment for all the 700 million people who, who are in the system. So basically, apart from giving the unique ID, there's also the way to do the online verification of your ID using a biometric uh, attribute. Then the next issue came was that uh, what has happened in the world is that, uh, especially after 9-11, uh, the requirements to identify who a person is to open a bank account or to get a mobile connection has become more and more important. This is called as KYC, or know your customer. And most systems that have a know your customer requirement, requirement uh, need a government photo ID. So if you want to open a bank account, you go to the bank and they'll say, show me your government photo ID. And these restrictions became more stringent after 9-11, because after 9-11, the FATA, which is the body that looks at all these things, came out with more and more stringent requirements for identifying people because they wanted to cut down on terrorist financing and so forth. And therefore, but poor people got left out because they didn't have any ID, and therefore they couldn't open a bank account. So that, that was a big problem. So we, then we, the organization worked with the various regulators to say that if you use the Aadhaar number and the customer agrees, then the name and address that we have in the Aadhaar database can be released to the bank for the purpose of uh, KYC. And this has now been rolled out by all the Indian banks, and they're opening about 30 to 40,000 bank accounts today, which is done in a very efficient manner. You walk in, you give your Aadhaar number, you authenticate your ID, and you open your bank account. And the same concept of opening the bank account with the KYC, it's called electronic KYC, can be used for mobile connections, insurance policies, pensions, and so on. So basically, it's now there's a common KYC across all products, which is instant, electronic, and paperless. And therefore, that's a huge 
benefit because now people get an ID, then they get a bank account with it and so on. So they get included in the, in the system. So the EKYC is also a very popular thing. And then going back to the issue of how do we make the government benefits reach more efficiently, we figured out a way to link the ID to a bank account number. And the government can now automatically credit the money into the bank account. So there's a person getting a pension, then first of all you use the ID to make sure that everybody is unique and then you just send the money to the ID and it goes to the bank account. And therefore it streamlines the whole payment system. Now this is a huge issue. Direct cash transfer or direct benefit transfer is a big issue today in, in public policy. So what we have built is really the infrastructure for making electronic cash transfer seamless, electronic, and in real time. And then using the authentication feature of this system, we have built a way for people to withdraw money from the bank account without using any debit card or any, any other physical thing. They can just go to an outlet in a village, put their finger, authenticate themselves, and take money out of the bank account. So this essentially means that millions of people getting various kinds of benefits will find it far easier to get access to the money in their bank account. So there are multiple benefits uh, accruing from this. The benefit of uniqueness that reduces waste, the benefit of uh, KYC, which allows people to open bank accounts much more easily, the benefit of pay, uh, other linked payments, which allows you to put money into somebody's account, and using biometric authentication to withdraw money so that the whole thing is simplified. And this is getting rolled out in, in a big way. Now, when we designed the system, we designed this to be a platform. And it's important to understand that what, what we mean by the platform. What happens in many countries is identity is closely linked to some particular usage of the identity. So identity is done for the purposes of security or, or financial inclusion or, or election system or whatever. But here the ID is built as a pure ID. So all that the ID system does is just says John is John or Ashok is Ashok. And an application on top of that will decide the particular usage of the ID. So when the ID is used in the banking system, it's used for a banking application. When the ID is in the uh, 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 healthcare system, it's used for a healthcare application. So this separation of ID from the application is a very fundamental principle which allowed us to think of this as a platform. And part of the reason is that the government designed it in that way and also made sure that this project in the government was not housed in any ministry that had a particular use for it because then that use tends to dominate. And this application, this group was housed in the planning commission so that it could think of all the applications rather than focus on any one. And this, I think, is a very important uh, design feature of this whole uh, system. Now, the other thing is that everything in the system is built as APIs, which means people can build applications on top of this. Uh, initially, obviously, the applications have been in the government sector like direct cash transfers and so on. Uh, right now there's an attendance system that has been implemented. More than 50,000 people are using this for online attendance recording in the government. But in the future, we expect to see private sector innovations happening uh, on this platform. Because once you have an ID platform which, is which has open APIs, which you can integrate into various applications, uh, then people will build, uh, build various things for that. And just last week, uh, there was a NASCOM product conference in Bangalore where a lot of entrepreneurs uh, had a session on how Aadhaar can be used in the applications and they're having a hackathon, I think on December 6th, where they're going to really get into how to build apps using this platform. So in the future, we visualize a large number of applications being built uh, on top of this platform. And I think that's the point I want to now spend a little bit of time on. It was, the idea was that the ID should be built as a platform. And I think that was a very important conceptual idea, which really creates more and more long-term uses of, of this particular capability. And this is really where, in some sense, it's a hybrid model. Because if you look at digital ecosystems, there are a class of digital ecosystems that have come from the government. And there are a class of digital ecosystems that have been built by private companies. And they have different attributes. If you think of the two most common, uh, the most powerful government-built ecosystems, one is the internet, 
and the other is GPS or global positioning system. Now in both these cases, what they have become today is very far from what they were conceived as. The internet was initially essentially a defense funded project in the US. The first technology, the internet, the so-called TCP IP protocol was there, built 40 years back and funded by DARPA, the defense agency of the US, essentially for dissimilar computers to communicate messages to each other. So that was the original goal, to build the infrastructure for communication, and that's how it developed 40 years back. The next big thing in the internet was again funded by European governments at CERN, where Tim Berners-Lee came up with the idea of the World Wide Web, or the HTTP protocol, which was again, he wanted an easy way for people, researchers to go from one site to another site. A third big development in the internet was, again, government funded at the University of Illinois, where the first browser was built, Mosaic. The idea, again, was to have a simple graphical user interface to the web. And then the private sector usage started. So all your Facebooks and Googles really began after all these fundamental investments happened. But it took 40 years for the internet to go from that first message sent to what we have today with all the apps that we have. So when you have a government created ecosystem, it's not planned from day one to be that ecosystem. It was not designed in 40 years back to have you know, some, some app here. So I think a government funded system takes time to evolve because different people at different points in history make diff decisions which ultimately lead to uh, an ecosystem flourishing. The same thing is true of GPS. GPS again was built in the last 40 years in the US and fundamentally driven by defense purposes it got a big boost in uh, when President Reagan was there. They had the whole Star Wars thing, and they wanted a way for sending ICBM missiles. They needed to know the exact location of the submarine, so they had to build a global positioning system, which was really built for missile targeting. But sometime in the year 2000, uh, the entire GPS was put in the commercial domain, and private companies could use GPS. And subsequently, in the last 14 years, we have a huge GPS economy. So whether it's maps, Google Maps, or whether it's self-driving cars, location-based services, Foursquare, you know, all kinds of things, all of them use GPS. Inertial navigating systems, telematics, all use GPS. So that again was a case of a government-funded ecosystem where private companies later on built innovative applications. But then again, it didn't begin with that goal. It began with a defense goal, moved into commercial usage, and had an ecosystem. So both the internet and GPS, though funded with government money, ultimately took time to reach innovation. On the other hand, when you think of private ecosystems done by companies, they happen much faster because private companies, especially where they have stable managements with continuity, can have a clear idea of what they want to do and do that very quickly. If you look at Apple, it's about barely in, in 2001 when Steve Jobs talked about the digital lifestyle. And if you go back to his speech, which he gave at Macworld in January of 2001, he talks about the future where it's going to be a digital lifestyle where you, you use your camera and put on your PC and so forth. And in some sense, in that speech, you have the elements of the iPod, which came two years later. You had the iPhone, which came in 2007. You had I So you know, he had a vision of what that digital lifestyle would look like. And he had 10, 12 years to roll it out. So, Similarly, if you look at Facebook and its goal to connect everybody, they were able to reach a billion users in 10 years. So private companies, because they're working in a, in, a, in, a, in a market space where they can focus on something and they can come out with a vision, they can actually stick to the vision very well. So on the one hand, you have government ecosystem that take a long time because there's no particular, you know, there's several events happen, and you can have private systems that build quickly. What we are trying to do was actually build a hybrid of this, which is we're building a government ecosystem for identity, but build it in a way that was pre-mediated so that in a very short time, we were able to actually create scale in the operation. So that makes it a little more complex to do that. And there were a few principles that we had. The first was that it should be too big to reverse. So the Basic principle is that when you're operating in a political system, uh, the window that you have for driving change is at best five years. I mean, 
five years. It could be more if, if the, you know, the same government continues. But uh, you have to assume that things change. So you have a window of five years to accomplish something. And therefore, you need to be so quick and scale up so quickly that it reaches a size which makes it essentially sustainable. And that's why from day one, our goal was that we would have 600 million people on the system, because 600 million people is a lot of people, and you know, you can't, you can't change that. The second principle in, in, in this whole thing is, make sure, you know, it's to get it embedded in uh, um, as many applications as possible. So the moment you know you embed it in applications like it's used for cash transfer or subsidy reform or whatever, then automatically you know it, it just gets more more in the system. So the, the, these were some of the principles that we had, which was that create a, a scale which which was essentially irrefutable, and uh, we're very fortunate that even though uh, we have had a change in the government, the new government of which my friend Arvind is a member of has really adopted Aadhaar in a big way and they're accelerating the usage for cash transfer, for subsidy reform, for attendance systems. They're, they're going to go to a billion users by next year. So I think it, it shows that you know, when you try to build an ecosystem in the, dig, in the public world, if you can bring the speed of what is possible in the private world and do it in the public world, then in effect you get a different sort of strategic uh, value. And I'm very confident that this is actually the basis for a large number of uh, reforms that will happen in India. I mean, the first obvious one is clearly identity and making sure everybody has an identity. That is a huge goal of social inclusion. The second is, is making sure that the uniqueness enables us to become more efficient in government spending. The third is building a cash transfer system which allows people to directly get benefits into their account. The fourth is uh, financial inclusion because by giving everybody an account and being able to withdraw money in a village, you know, everybody comes into the ecosystem, then you can connect that to mobile payments. Then there's the whole issue of subsidy reforms. For today, for example, the entire LPG system in India is being reformed using Aadhaar, where instead of having a subsidized LPG cylinder, it's sold at market price, and you get the cash in your bank, which allows you to reform things very differently. And then finally, there's the whole private innovation that will come in the next few years where entrepreneurs will build apps that require ID of some kind and use that, and that will really cause its overall usage to become even more ubiquitous. And so I think this is the way uh, digital ecosystems need to be done. And I think this concept of digital ecosystems in government, other is just an example, but I would say the same thing applies, for example, for healthcare records, one of the challenges in the US is the high cost of healthcare records. It's now trying to get everyone to have healthcare records. They're all parked in the payer, the payee, the pharmacy, you know, hospital, wherever, but they don't really have an interoperable system where a consumer can say, this is my healthcare record and I can take it with me. Now, that's a classic case of a digital ecosystem that can't be done by private companies, but has to be done by a state because it really requires a level playing field for everybody. Or you can think of a ecosystem for accelerating justice where you, you have portability of cases and so forth. Or you can think of a digital ecosystem for making education more fungible where you have nationwide portability of your degree courses so that you can take it anywhere and so forth. So what I'm saying is that I think the nature of public policy in a digital world will require a whole new thinking of how we build digital ecosystems. And it's very important in these systems to be clear what is the role of the state and what is the role left to the private sector? Because I think the government role should be really to just define the platform, the rules of engagement, the playing field, how, who are the actors, how do they interact with each other, what is the way they message each other, what are the rules for security, what are the rules for privacy? Those rules really are, have to be defined by the state, but on, the, on, on those rules, if then people build apps, then you can dramatically accelerate innovation and in accelerate productivity. And this is something which I think has to be the way we think about designing this, these systems. Also, I think the other, to me, the lesson is that in, in the public space, uh, productivity comes from improving productivity of billions of small transactions. In other words, it's not about building more complex systems. It's about building simple systems, but scale them up to a billion people. 
So if, if you give everyone an ID and give a billion people an ID, and if you make it easier for them to use their ID to enter an airport or to get their money or to get a job, and you multiply that by a billion people having 100 transactions a year, that's 100 billion transactions that are become more efficient. And therefore, efficiency and productivity comes not just from big stuff, but by taking billions of micro transactions and making them more efficient. That's where you can use a platform kind of approach. I mean, for example, one could argue that what India's healthcare needs is not more complex, uh, you know, genome sequencing or, or DNA or whatever. It maybe just requires a way where every child's height and weight is captured electronically in real time. And that may be a better way to figure out what's happening uh, with children and their, you know, and their uh, health issues. So I think the way we think about problem solving uh, in, in, in this environment, a public environment has to be simple solutions at scale and build it at scale. And one of the things that I learned from this exercise was if you want to create scale, you have to design the scale from day one. You can't impose scale or you can't retrofit scale later on. And you have to reduce friction for scaling up. And one of the reasons for friction is simply that there are lots of departments in government and everybody has their own agenda and their own turf. And if you design a solution that is very heavy and makes too many people try to stop it, then it, it won't go anywhere. And therefore, you have to make it a very thin, minimalistic design so that you can do it very, very quickly. You know, one of the our biggest design constraint was how to keep it as minimal as possible. Everybody said, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? So the normal tendency is to you know, add lots of bells and whistles, but that's the wrong way to do it because the moment you make it heavy, then it creates more you know, people against it. And therefore, if you really want something to succeed, you have to keep it simple and just sort of, it's more minimal invasive surgery kind of approach to design. So I think uh, there's a lot of learnings from this. So, so I think uh, digital ecosystems is the way to go. And I think it's one is, of course, you all, we'll always have your private sector ecosystems. But even governments have to think of creating ecosystems, creating platforms, doing the minimal thing to define the rules of the game, and then letting innovation and enterprise right on top of that. Thank you very much. Is uh, minimalist uh, in keeping with uh, the spirit of the last comment. Um, can you? Can I just ask you one question? Uh, is there something you feel that you would have done differently about Aadhaar, uh, in with the experience of the last uh, however many years it took to get to where we are right now? In the spirit of experimenting your way to this philosophy that you articulated so cogently, now. No, I think uh, I would say. By and large, we got the big things right. Uh, we had our share of small battles here and there, but but I think uh, I think it was all right. I, th I think we lucked out actually. We just got lucky. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to open it up and then I'll <laughs> come back uh, come back into it. Could you so? The floor is open for uh, for questions uh, as opposed to speeches. So why don't you start? Please? Could you just introduce your, say, your name or your affiliation or something like that? Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry, if you could grab the mic since we're... Uh... Hi. You talked about the fungibility and interoperability um, issue. I was wondering what happens when Aadhaar becomes the only option you have and when identity becomes non-fungible, when that's the only option you can use as you embed it into more and more systems. Well, it, it's like a core... Uh, core attribute, right? And uh, so, I mean, in the US, everybody has a social security number. So it's, it's, it's gonna be like that. It's just, it's one more thing which you need to make it happen. She has a lot of angst about that. Well, I, th I think uh, like she should- body language. Yeah. <laughs> she should worry about what's happening here because What's happening here is that you have private companies which collect every attribute of your life and you have the NAC looking at that data. So I really think that's a far, far bigger issue
than any privacy issue with Aadhaar. Gita, can you use the mic? Project. Uh, but um, let me ask the one question which I'm sure you've, you've been asked before. Uh, the biometrics will ensure that this fingerprint indeed belongs to me. What it doesn't ensure is that I am who I say I am. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the data validation issues internally in terms of the data that's been collected? Uh, it has been something that's been an issue that's been raised multiple times. Well, the thing is that this is an ID system that after you claim that you're somebody, subsequently verifies that you are that somebody, right? So when you enter into the system, you enter with some ID. But then that's your ID subsequently in the formal system. Now, if you choose to enter into the system with some other ID, that's your ID for the rest of your life. That's why I talked about 21st century Ellis Island, because you know, when people land Ellis Island and they had a long complicated name, the, the guy at the immigration just made it, uh, made it Dan Brown. So from that day onwards, he was Dan Brown. And so similarly, even if somebody chooses to enter this system with a different name, that's his name in this system from there on. You know, if, 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 if somebody says, I'm Amitabh Bachchan from now on, he's Amitabh Bachchan in the system. That doesn't mean the real Amitabh Bachchan doesn't have an ID. He has one too. So you will, it's logical that you go in with your real ID. Now, if you're a poor person with no documents, you don't have a birth certificate, then you will start your journey in this system with some ID. So it's, it's that, it's, but the question is, after you enter the system with some name, what is the quality of verification after that? That's really the question. And that's very, very high. Uh, we believe it's a very high accuracy there. So I think the question is more in terms of what is entering the system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been numerous arguments about terrorism, uh, illegal alienation, and a whole bunch of different issues that don't want something. No, yeah. So first of all, uh, the, the last thing a terrorist would do is get an Aadha number. <laughs> because I think if I, if I want to be a terrorist in, in, in a different country, you, you, you would choose the weakest form of ID to be in that system. I mean, if you look at what happened in 2611, the guy, when he got into the hotel and registered, had an ID from some college in Bangalore. So when you have multiple IDs, then I would go with the weakest. So I think the, the terrorism, a terrorist would not go in for another number because it's, it's, it's the strongest ID system there is. As far as the issue of citizenship and so on goes, the Aadha number was never meant to be a citizenship number. It's an ID number. It just says Ashok is Ashok, John is John, Adam is Adam, Eve is Eve. Whether Adam or Eve is an American or a Canadian or a Martian is a decision taken by the appropriate authority. It's an application of ID. So I think, uh, and you cannot solve the citizenship problem without solving the ID problem. Because unless you, you have a way of uniquely identifying everyone and have a, have a way of uniquely verifying that person is the same person, you can't even think of figuring out who is a citizen. So think of ID as a precursor to uh, establishing citizenship as, as opposed to saying citizenship is a basis for giving ID. Because you'll never solve that problem. Not with 50% 50, 50, 50 of your population not having birth certificates. Uh, back there in the corner. Uh, with too many social identities in India, many, many wonder, you know, which is the supreme identity. So I'm just curious, when you were brainstorming the whole UID project, uh, did the team consider turning passports into biometric identity? I mean, why, what was the need for a, for a new uh, national identity? Well, the thing is, a uh, number of things. One is a passport, the total number of people in India who have passports is less than 5%. Right? We had to build a system that did 1 million a day. There are totally only 50 million passports in India. So you have to, you have, to have scalability. You have to, you know, if you're going to get a billion people, then you have to do something that does a million plus a day. Second thing is you needed a digital identity. I, I, we, we felt that we needed a digital identity in the 21st century, and I think we are right in that. And you see the issues in this country now. You're going to two-factor authentication. 
uh, you know, people are losing credit card numbers, people are losing photographs. Uh, I mean, more and more authentication of ID on the, on the cloud is going to become very, very critical. So having a strong digital identity is important for that. So we had to build a digital identity system. The, th the third thing was that uh, uniqueness had to be established. Now, passports don't establish uniqueness. I mean, there's no, no, other, no other ID system that establishes uniqueness. And uniqueness is critical if you want to make sure that, you know, in the long term, there's a, a person has only one ID. So the whole number of design reasons why it didn't make sense to start with. An, we obviously looked at if there's an existing platform, we, we could reuse it, but we didn't really have anything. So I assume that uh, there was, there's been a ro robust discussion about possible drawbacks of the system. Sure, sure. Uh, and the um, uh, implications for privacy, even civil and human rights. Sure. I mean, for example, you know, I, I assume that my iris can be scanned without my knowledge and without my consent. Now, that can be done in a situation where I might be preferring a certain anonymity or a certain privacy of my actions. So I'm just curious to know how these problems of possible erosion of civil sure, rights sure. and human rights are going to be addressed. Yeah. First of all, I just want to point out that most of the people actually want to be recognized and not be forgotten. You know, the people who are being left out and who want to come in. So I think we should keep that in mind. Uh, the the couple of important things. One is the information the ID system collects is minimal. It's not a data collection system. It's not like one of these internet companies that collects everything about you. The only only data about a person in the system is the name, address, date of birth, sex, and the uh, biometrics. Second is that the biometrics, when the biometric is used for verification, we send a message to the person that you have been authenticated. So it's like when you use a credit card, you get an SMS. So we actually built a system like that. So if somebody is even trying, I mean, it's, difficult, it's not possible to use a, your iris somewhere else, but even if somebody is trying, then you will get a notification that your ID is being used in a transaction. So the whole host of design and other technological things to uh, minimize the impact. And finally, I think you have to make a choice between what's the net positive value of something. And I think the net positive value here hugely, hugely outweighs the risks. As I said, I would be far more worried about internet companies collecting my data here and giving it to the NSA, which is what is happening every day. Uh, my name is Cardi Subramanian. I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. Uh, I have, well, first, the, the, the scale and ambition of the project is sort of hard to wrap your head around, so it, it's really just amazing. Um, several questions, I'll, I'll, in, in order of which ones I'm sort of most excited to hear the answer to. Just, just, ask one. just one, okay. Um, uh, Pr Pratap Mehta recently had sort of an op ed in which he sort of suggested that India has sort of a 1950s state trying to run a postmodern 21st century economy for 1.2 billion people. Uh, you know, in, in sort of in international development, which is what, what we study at the Kennedy School, uh, you know, they talk about developing countries sort of uh, leapfrogging, you know, investing in technologies or, or methods that might leapfrog the way that, you know, now developed countries did things. This is sort of an example of within a developing country, a project that's in some ways leapfrogging the capacity of the state itself. Can you talk about the frictions of trying to roll out something pretty sophisticated and advanced within the context of a pretty weak uh, state infrastructure? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it was possible because we were able to assemble a team of very capable people from all over the world. Uh, we have the advantage that a lot of Indians who have worked in technology, both in India and abroad, and they were willing to work on this project. And we had some very talented people from the government who were assigned to this. So we were able to assemble a, a very unique set of people uh, for this. And I think it's a credit to the government that they gave us the full freedom and autonomy to execute for five years. So I think the combination of the fact that we had a very talented team and we had about as much autonomy as you can get in a government situation enabled us to pull this off. So to replicate this kind of thing requires political will and space. It requires talent assembled from 
within and without, and of course, some purpose and execution capability. Just to, it's just, not easy. Just to build on that, I mean, there are some winners and losers here, right? There are people who are benefiting from the, for instance, the ghost identities and so on. So is there, huh? was there who? any organized backlash? Yeah, of that? course there was backlash. Yeah, so I think that's what he's asking for, the friction. No, no, he's saying state capacity. He's saying, ca can the state execute such sophisticated stuff? And I think that was your point, right? So I said that it required assembly of various things. In terms of the opposition, uh, obviously, you know, there you know there are many aspects to it there's, there's ideological opposition uh, the there's the you know the civil rights human rights privacy people malvika and all uh, then <laughs> then we had the uh, people worrying that this would be used to convert state provided welfare schemes into cash, for example. You would stop giving health care and give health vouchers or stop giving, having education. So that's the state receding from public services argument. That's the left argument on this. The right argument on this was basically citizenship and giving Bangladeshis numbers and so forth. So there was an argument on the left and the argument on the right. And then there was the, uh, the cor corruption argument, which is that this is going to dramatically change transparency, which meant that it, you know, it obviously would affect interests of income and rent collectors. And then there was the bureaucratic problem, which was that there were multiple turf battles that had to be fought. So there are many, many dimensions to this, ideological, economic, and territorial. Uh, at the back, the last. Mihir, you want to use the mic? Thank you. Hello, my name is Mihir, and you touched on scale at the end. And I was wondering, outside of a project in, on the digital side, if there's something in education or health where there have been a number of market-based solutions, but they've not gone to scale, do you feel that the government is now ready to, or is the, is the government the right entity to scale up such interventions? Uh, what do you mean, like what? Like for example, Pratham, for, you know, their model has, and that's probably the best model of uh, market-based solution that has gone to a certain point, but not export. Do you feel the government can take up health and education issues and scale them up going ahead? Well, uh, I mean, Pratham actually works more with directly with people. I, uh, it's not, I mean, the way Pratham works is they have volunteers go out, so it's not really in the government system. Now, obviously, government has scale, I mean, you know, Go, let's take education in India. Government spends billions of dollars in education. It opens thousands of primary schools, has millions of teachers, buys blackboards, chalk, and so on. But the outcomes are not there. So while there is scale, you, you don't have the effectiveness of that scale. The trick is how do you combine both effectiveness and scale? And some of the solutions that happen in the private sector or in the nonprofit sector are not necessarily government solutions. So it's a tricky question. I mean, if you want to fix it, you need to have scale, you need to have uh, effectiveness, and uh, you need to have an innovative approach. And not all projects have that, or not all things have that. But is, uh, just, just on that, is there a, for instance, like in a wish list in your comments also, you talked about down the road possibilities in education and health. Is there, um, an example of a project in, let's say, primary education that you think that this digital ecosystem can be used for with some imagination in a yeah, reasonable we, horizon? Yeah, uh, we think so, and uh, but we think that probably will have to be done outside the government. But what would, what would it be? What It's so actually an idea which uh, Rooney and I are working on right now, which is how do we create a, a learning platform at scale using s smart devices which with mm -hmm. game-based learning, which allow millions of kids to learn under in various uh, non-profit or for-profit locations. But that's completely outside the... It's uh, not the, uh, connected to Aadhaar. That's just no, 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 no. It's not connected to Aadhaar. Okay. Sorry, yeah, Amar. Hi, Amar. Sorry, you gotta wait. Amar, you tell them who you are and that... Yeah, say who you are. Yeah. I'm you Amar. hung around together in IIT in 1975. <laughs> he even acted in a play I wrote, so... Uh, <laughs> He's probably trying to forget that. <laughs> so um, you mentioned that uh, one of the things you try to try to do to prevent reversibility of the uh, of the project 
if the government changed, was to do it quickly and on very large scale. And this reminded me a little bit about Andre trying to create oligarchs quickly in Russia. But that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's by the by. Uh, <laughs> what else? I mean, so I have two questions. One is, what else did you do to try to pr uh, prevent reversibility? And two, uh, were you not taking a risk that the process would be reversed by running as a member of the Congress Party from Bangalore? that you would be rejected, that... Well, I think the fact that in spite of that, it continues shows the resilience of its irreversibility. Okay. So, yeah, that's the second part. As to what <laughs> all we did, I think the first is scale, 600 million people on the system. The second is uh, having usage, so it was, it was being used for cash transfers, for subsidy reform, for attendance. So the, the more users of it, then obviously, it's more uh, this thing. The third thing was that we had to build a system where the innovation migrated to the outside. What I meant by that was that the system had to be simple enough so that everything could be built and subsequent innovation happened outside, outside the system. Because there's a lot of bureaucratic gravity which operates in these things. So you need to make sure that you get the innovation in the half-life of the time that you have. And so as I would say, get the innovation right, get scale, embed the applications. So you didn't do anything to build bridges on the other side of the aisle while this process was going on in the anticipation that the government would change? No, I mean, I, 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 I was in touch, but, uh, you know, I mean, I should, maybe Arvind should tell what, what is happening on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, it... Uh, I don't think it was a fundamental disagreement. It was more a political disagreement, or what you do when you're in opposition kind of disagreement. There's a bunch in the middle here. I don't know if you can get the mic to the center, and then they can pass it from one to the other. Hi, uh, my name's Harshal. I'm a biomedical engineer at MGH. My question was about the APIs, which would be publicly available. So as a private company accessing these APIs, would Aadhaar provide any kind of certification or support for these companies to develop their applications? And what about the application itself, how will the data be secure within a private agency's application? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Aadhaar is just a platform, and uh, but we do have a project, or rather we mean, I keep saying we, but the Aadha, I'm no longer there, but the government has a project called the Aadhaar Diffusion Project, where they're working with uh, entrepreneurs to help create ecosystems so they know how to use this, uh, use this technology. So while well, they're not providing funding, but they're doing everything else. And we hope over time that VCs, angels, and others will come in to fund, fund this. And uh, quite a few people are looking at that. Uh, the APIs are all on the website. You can go and check it out right now. All APIs are there. Now remember what the APIs are for. APIs are there for authentication. So what that means is that, let's say that you have a healthcare application and you want to verify somebody's ID before releasing his medical record. He goes in somewhere and says, my Aadhaar number is one, two, three. Here's my fingerprint. That request goes to the Aadhaar system that replies saying, yes, he is that person. So all that the API does is verify that X is X, that Adam is Adam. So there's no data that is sent down. It's just a verification of identity. The only data which is sent down is the know your customer, when you authorize it. So you go to a bank and say, I am X, I want to open a bank account, and I hereby authorize the Aadhaar system to release my name and address, only then it releases the name and address to the bank. So there's no data, which, there's no data sharing except customer-initiated data sharing. This, yeah, next to you, the two people, go ahead. My name is Cristina Martinez. Um, thank you very much. I think you are presenting to us a brilliant idea to save money to the government and to expedite the, proce the process of distribution and benefiting the people. Uh, my question is, what is the difference between your system and a big brother system. Yeah, well, see, as I say, you, you already have big brother right here, but anyway, forget that. <laughs> uh, it is not 
a data collection system of individuals. It's only an ID system. So beyond the first four or five things that you have about a person, it doesn't collect any more information. The second is that the only use of this system is either to verify your identity or to get, give your name and address with your approval to a legitimate counterparty like a bank. And the, and the third thing is that the data about you is in the application. So example, if you go to a bank and withdraw money, the banking system knows about you, not the ID system. If you go to the hospital and uh, do, uh, uh, do some tests, the hospital knows about it, not the ID system. So by design, it's constrained to do only two things. And that's why it's not Big Brother. It's absolute control of the people. Your mobile phone is far more dangerous than other. It can be tracked. You, your GPS location is known. Your, you, your SMSs can be read. Your calls can be heard. I mean, then you should ban mobile phones too. Hello, my name is Rohan Pavaluri. I'm a freshman in the college. Uh, so the biggest problem you seem to have discussed is scalability of this project. Uh, were there any cultural problems unique to India with implementing Aadhaar? Well, obviously, you know, to have 25,000 enrollment stations across the country in different languages, different groups, training them, challenges of dealing with uh, unlettered people on getting them to enroll, verifying the data, the data which they can't read. These are all a lot of uh, issues that, that we faced. And, we, you know, but we, that's why keeping it simple was very important, that uh, making sure, for example, it, 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 it's in all Indian languages. And uh, it's, in, it's bilingual in the sense it's in English and, say, Hindi, or English and Kannada, or English and Tamil. And we had to use automatic transliteration for handling that. And then let's say that you have a person who enrolls in Orissa, it's in English and English and Oriya. And then that person goes to Tiruvanthapuram, it's that same, it's there, it's English and Malayalam. So we have to find a way for national portability across languages. So there were a lot of very complex issues that had to be sorted out. Um, I'm Ajantha Subramanian and I teach in the anthropology department. Um, I liked very much what you said about your use of biometrics as serving a somewhat atypical purpose. You know, you I mean, it's atypical in a sense, not the way the Western world has exactly, used it. Yeah. yeah, so typically it's used for forensics or surveillance, and you said you know, you're using it for developmental purposes, right? Um, and I mean, you, you, you seem to place a lot of stock in legibility, right? That a person has to be legible, right? Identifiable to the government, and that that facilitates- no, Not to the government. for. I mean, that's just one use. I mean, uh, if a person walks into a train, he has to show his ID. Right. If a person wants a job, he has to show his ID. Right. So it's 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 part of your life. Yeah, but but for you, that that kind of legibility is really important for ensuring um, the efficient delivery of welfare of entitlement. And, and to give those people uh, an acknowledgement of existence. Okay, um, I mean, I think people exist in all sorts of arenas, right? Not yeah, yeah. just yeah. But I mean, at, I, I study development from an anthropological perspective, and it's not so much that people don't have unique identities that stops them from getting welfare benefits, it's social power, right? I mean, there are all sorts of mitigating factors, right? Whether you're low cost, whether you're working class, et cetera, which get in the way of your receiving services. So to what extent is legibility really the solution? To no, the it's, it's a huge part of that because I'm not saying it's the only solution, and, and certainly there are other social barriers to uh, getting things. But essentially, for example, I'll give an example. How does a person get a pension in a village today? First, he has to be in the pension system, which requires there's some rent seeking at that point. Then the pension flows manually to some guy in the village, and then he dishes it out, and that's where the Problem starts, right? right? Now, let's assume that after you establish that he's eligible for a pension and he gets a pension of 500 rupees a month, you set up a system where electronically, in real time, that money goes straight into his bank account. Then he gets a text message on his mobile phone, and now we have 900 million mobile phones, so it's not that people don't have mobile phones. A text message on his mobile phone that his money has been received. 
and let's say that he can go into one out of million outlets and withdraw the money in a commercial transaction, you have transformed his experience with the system because he's not encountering that agent because you by creating a multi multi point network if i find if this particular guy is preventing me from getting my money i just go to the next guy just like you go to a different shop if you don't get good service so by creating a choice in the hands of the person where the service delivery is not linked to only one outlet you the bargaining power shifts from the service provider to the individual and that is actually the biggest thing because all public delivery in india so there is no choice of where you get it from and that's when all the problems start so if you can switch the thing and create bargaining power in the hands of the of the of the beneficiary then the whole thing changes so that's one way of addressing it i'm not saying it is all the problem but one of them i think it's an interesting empirical question as to to what extent what you're calling the legibility um gets around some of the social strata but it's an interesting question so Uh, yeah, Beth, you have the mic. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name is Shelly. Um, so, when you were planning and designing uh, how to build the infrastructure, you mentioned you uh, coordinate with various stakeholders in the private and public sector. So, one question is: um, there were many agencies um, that already had their databases, and their the companies have their databases anyway. So what incentives did you provide to companies and other organizations to adapt um the Aadhaar and put it into their system? Second, do you feel you could have coordinated with one of the central agencies from the beginning um in the planning stage rather than getting with them later on? Well, we no, we consulted them in the beginning. I mean, all these interactions with different agencies happened in the first 6 months. So it's we began talking to them early. Uh well, you know, the ev everybody had a stake in it because if i am a state government which is giving pensions or public distribution of rice and if my if my and my delivery is inefficient because 20 30% of the people in the system are fake then they saw the value of using aadhaar to make the database unique so that's so th they had a stake in it or if it was a bank it allowed them to address the kyc requirements or for an insurance company it allowed them to create a single customer id uh, around which multiple policies could be sold so everybody had a certain value proposition that we were able to identify so that's how they came onto the platform and convincing them of that is part of the game evangelizing the value is is a big part of what we had to do thank you yeah go ahead um i'm gorav i'm a student at hbs uh so adoption comes after usability and without a proper penetration of network inside india having end devices to use this database from without having that infrastructure do you feel that the adoption might be delayed and the project might become less relevant in the future because right now if you if you have this uh, system of um, subsidizing the cylinders and paying the people directly in the banks and now half of the in uh, half of the country does not have that network to support this function so they are still working on ras ration cards and without the aadhar do you feel that this is going to push back the actual deployment of the no no it, see today you have mobile connectivity is is quite ubiquitous i would say 90% of the population has mobile connectivity and this technology works on the mobile phone on a regular 2g connection so it's it's very lightweight it can work on a mobile phone and uh, finally it's demand and supply right i mean if, if you push billions of transactions then these the device will happen so you know you you also have to create a pull for for these things i'll give an example lpg cylinders in india there are 120 140 150 million users and they buy 10 cylinders a year on average that's 1.5 billion cylinders sold every year now if you sell them at market price and transfer the cash transfers that's 1.5 billion cash tra cash transfer transactions every year which reach 150 million people so once you start pumping that money into those accounts then automatically the delivery system will then respond to creating outlets where they can withdraw the money so you have to, you have to push the system to doing this see in, in india airports are not built uh, ahead of time 
you have a lot of airlines and then they're circling in the air and they're waiting to land and then they put pressure to build airports. So you have to build a demand-based model for infrastructure. Hi, uh, my name is Sparsh. I'm a student at HPS. Uh, so my question is, if the ambition of the project uh, is to be as ubiquitous as, as, as SSN in the US, so what about the diaspora of Indian people living abroad? So for NRIs, uh, since passports and identities are kind of different, and so one, that, and then could it in the future be linked to probably NRIs being allowed to vote without really being physically present in India? Well, uh, as of now, the way it's defined, it's, it's a number for residents. But the law, which is going to come soon, what Malvika, uh, will, will allow the government to define new categories of people who are eligible for this number. So the government in future can say, okay, NRI is eligible. That's not our decision, but the government can take that decision. Voting is a separate issue because voting has two parts. One is uh, establishing that you're a voter, which can be done electronically. And second is choice of what you vote, whom you vote for, which has to be anonymous. So if you allow electronic voting, then you run the risk of anonymity being compromised. So I would say that I would use it to establish your eligibility, but the actual vote should be cast differently. Um, I'm Mark Mitchell from the School of Public Health. And my question is very specific because I'm interested in the application of this for medical records for children. And it's been a problem to establish unique identities or unique identifiers for very young children because they have this annoying habit of growing. And of what? so, they're, they're, so they're, their fingerprints, for example, change and so forth. So I wonder if you've looked at um, the, the lowest age and how you can identify very young children. Sure. Uh, actually, that's a great point. In fact, uh, I remember Rohini and I had dinner with Bill Gates about two months after we started, and he raised the same issue because he was looking at immunity and so on, uh, and vaccinations. So the way we designed this was we said that even a child can get the number, uh, but the biometrics on, for the fingerprint are not stable till the age of 15, and the bi biometrics of the iris is not stable till the age of five. So we said from zero to five, we give the number, but we attach the mother or the guardian to that number so that they, you know, so that we use that for verification. At the age of five, uh, so they still get the number. And at the age of five, they come in and record the iris. And at the age of 15, they come in to record the fingerprint. So we do give numbers for, uh, for, baby, uh, for babies and so forth. And the, they're looking at actually using this for a uh, immunization tracking thing. Where, because immunization takes a two years and so forth. So you need to make sure the same, she's got all the things. So that is being looked at as an app. Um, regarding scaling up Aadhaar, uh, I was wondering, especially with regard to rural areas, how you, if there have been any measures put in place to tackle corruption issues similar to what other similar, other programs that involve IDs or job cards like Narega face in terms of implementation of the same, um, in for example, Narega has job cards, but there are so many coast workers, and there's also so much trouble that some rural, uh, some people in rural areas face in order to get a job card in itself. So there would probably be similar issues with uh, an Aadhaar card where you have to bribe someone to get an Aadhaar card, so. Well, there were two ways that we tackled this. One was for, by having multiplicity of enrolling entities. Often, a lot of corruption happens because of monopolies, right? So if only one guy in the village can issue the Narega job card, then you, will, you can have corruption. But we designed a system where the state government could be an enrolling partner, a bank could be an enrollment partner, the post office was an enrollment partner. So somebody could go to either the bank or to the post office or to the state government to enroll. That creates choice, goes back to that bargaining power thing. And second, by having uh, ubiquity of enrollment stations. So we have 25,000. So, and it's nationwide enrollment. So if you are a person from Jharkhand working in Delhi, you can enroll in Delhi. So anytime, anywhere enrollment. So all these things simply reduce the ability for anyone to, to have corruption because corruption happens only when there's no choice for the person. Hi, uh, 
My name is Ravi. So my question is from mainly the technology side. So uh, you have this data center, and I'm not sure all of these data centers are in India. Or They're all in India. They're all in India. So now what happens if there is any natural disaster or something like that? So if uh, going forward, if you become more and more dependable on this system. No, no, there are multiple data centers with disaster recovery and uh, backups. There are like, you know, very good chances that natural, uh, like, you know, natural disaster can kind of sweep all the data centers in the country. At the same time. I mean, in case the people who are kind of NRIs or maybe I am out of India at that time. And no, no, like, data I'm is there. Like you may be out of India, but. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what happens to the identity in that case? I mean, just like. No, no. There, there's a there, there are two data centers. There'll ultimately be three of them. There's one in Bangalore, one in Delhi, which are active active, which means that at any time you can switch over from one to the other. And there is backups of this data in other third party locations. So there's a lot of I mean this is a problem that many companies face, right? I mean, what happens if Facebook But loses the many something? companies do this like Amazon, Google, yeah, or they yeah. have data centers in yeah, different yeah. different countries. But no, we don't. You we, we, no, we, this is we can't have this data outside India. But yeah, exactly, yeah, that's my point. Yeah, but you're, you, you're worried there'll be a flood simultaneously in Delhi and Bangalore. I mean, no, I'm just is? like you know, thinking about what the government is thinking about. You know, having this more secure. Multiple data centers and backups. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vanita Shastri, my question is actually similar to his. I was concerned about you know the security of the data, and because so many things can you know you're using it for you know pension and other things and yeah. that. So Explain the architecture. It's, it's only used for verification and for uh, KYC. So it's not like, it's not collecting data. Anyway, go ahead. No, um, but at some point there'll be a crash or there'll be somebody's going to hack into it or, um, you know, and so how are, how are you know, you security? Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of, well, uh, a lot of thing has gone into that. I mean, for example, uh, data is encrypted at source. So when you enroll, it's a, uh, uh, very high level of encryption, which is then encrypted. And so when it travels from the enrollment to the main center, it's all completely encrypted. Uh, it's anonymized. So uh, it's both encrypted and anonymized, which means that if you were to look at the biometric, you, you won't know whose it is because it's been anonymized. So there are a lot of things done like that. I would say it's, it's a lot more secure than many systems around. Let's take one last question here. You're the last word. Yeah. I am Tina with uh, Citizens Financial Services. So I think much of it we have here as well because everybody has a social security number who lives here and when you apply for a job, um, you go fingerprinting and you're identified the same way. And I think that works. But uh, many people must be watching very closely what you're doing by people, I mean governments or the companies outside of India. So where do you have the big interest from and uh, who else would like to implement it next? Or what's the response like from the global platform? Well, you know, it, it depends on which application is driving this. In some countries, uh, they need an ID system to improve their voting to make sure there's no fraudulent votes. Some people want ID systems to improve financial inclusion. Some people want it for subsidy reforms. So the different drivers for this. And uh, I think there's a lot of interest around the, around the world. And in fact, now the World Bank has a group called uh, ID4D, which is ID for Development, where they're trying to bring a cross-functional group across people working on healthcare, pensions, financial inclusion, to see how more people can adopt such a platform. So this is quite a bit, I mean. When I was there, we had at least 25 countries visiting us. So. You know, personally, the uh, the thing that, so I've, I've been following this for some time, thanks to, thanks to Nandan and his team. And personally, the thing that I find coolest about this is the minimalism and, and those early decisions, which have proven to be, I think, uh, so clever in some ways that uh, at appropriately, you know, anticipating the criticism and negating it and allowing for scalability. I think that's just been really, really an, an incredibly interesting feature of this. Um, but we promised to end at 7.30, and uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Nandan for really a stimulating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.